My name is Jim McDonough. I, um, many of you have already had to deal with me just to get your talk in here. Um, that's my once a year job. I'm normally the Samba and HPC team lead. So I'm assuming that everybody here knows what Samba is. Um, this goes way back to uh, the 80s when the PC started. Uh, IBM real recognized the need to throw some money in, and, and there were just there was this thing called the PC LAN program. Had these really funky adapters, cost a fortune. Um, but the protocol was born by Dr. Barry Feigenbaum at IBM back then. Um, this caught on, got integrated into OS2, Windows for Workgroups. Um, and there were some products that started growing on Unix machines to be able to connect to these. So in, in, pro, in the process of doing his PhD thesis in physics, uh, Tridge decided he needed to, to connect. He had a, um, a, an, a DEC Ultrix workstation, and he had this Pathworks product there that it was a DEC station 3100, I believe. No, it was too early for a 3100. No, that was the right time for a 3100. Um, and it had this product called Pathworks. It had a DOS client. That's the only. That's how he got started on this. He needed his DOS client now to connect to a Solaris box as well. So he quickly hacked this thing. And uh, I have to apologize. I inadvertently lied in my abstract. I said that this was older than Linux. It doesn't predate the kernel, but it predates the release of the of the little user space tools that that. Uh, Linus also released shortly afterwards. Um, but it quickly became adopted uh, in a lot of areas. And when we knew it really hit was when it was started showing, showing up in these little QNX boxes as a way to access the configuration files. Um, printing support soon followed. And then uh, I think the first major really update was when uh, shortly after I joined the pro project, uh, when the Asama could finally be an NT domain controller. And it's still around in a lot of places as an NT domain controller. And uh, a lot of people just don't want to get rid of that. Um, now, in terms of the modern CIFS client uh, in the kernel, that started around the same time I was working with Steve French at IBM at the time. He saw the need to get rid of, to replace the aging file system SMBFS that had been there. So he started this one from scratch. Um, around that time, we also added the support to be a, a member server in, a, in an AD domain. Um, that's still probably the biggest use today as, as a member server file server. And, at, and then while at IBM also, um, Tridge and I worked on making it clustered on top of GPFS. Uh, and the CTDB project was born. And we now ship that as part of um, HA, or we have for quite a while on top of OCFS2. And let's see, um, Microsoft in the meantime had just let everything go. They really didn't care about it anymore, even though they were the, the, the partial, the uh, alternate year host of the conference for it every year. They didn't even bother showing up to the conference. So that group eventually figured out that they, things needed to happen if we want to stay alive. And actually for the purpose of Azure, they uh, introduced a new revision of the protocol, complete revision of the protocol, SMB2. And we've pretty much been chasing that ever since because they keep adding new features rapidly. Um, probably the more public um, community interest is in the, the Active Directory Domain Controller. Um, we have not done that for a long time because it's got an embedded Heimdall Kerberos. Um, so it, not only is it Heimdall, it's a customized Heimdall Kerberos. And that's just something we can't ship because we already have the MIT, even though we used to have the Heimdall Kerberos implementation. And then the last time I talked to you about this was in Harukov uh, a few years back. So here I'm going to tell you what, what's been going on since then. So about that same time, actually this was probably big news. Um, there was lots of groaning at first, but uh, Apple needed to do something because Apple Talk was really very aging. And so they switched to using their own SMB server um, for file sharing. And that really uh, is a big part of the market today, too, the compatibility there. And we're seeing lots of requests for features that are specific for the Apple clients. Um, Dave Disseldorp, who now works on the uh, SES on the product, um, I was sad to lose him, but he's fantastic for them. 
integrated this with ButterFS and, and Snapper, and so copy chunk and rage cloning, what typically used to happen on a Windows client to Samba server or even Windows server, if you were copying something in one directory, the data went both ways. So this now allows with copy chunk and range cloning. Copy chunk just says, just go ahead and copy that remotely, um, and we'll and it'll do a copy. With range cloning, it actually uses uh, in ButterFS. It just it's basically like a CP uh, minus minus ref link. It just changes and adds some pointers. And uh, his demo was a one gigabyte copy that would take minutes to do traditionally. Took a few seconds to do with the copy chunk. Add the range cloning, and it happened just like that. Um, he added remote snapshot management, so on Windows side you can see previous file versions. Um, and that support, to, to view it was there already, he added the ability to take this, to initiate the snapshots, and then uh, ButterFS compression, which surprisingly still is a big deal for a lot of customers. They really want compression to work, that just, they feel like it saves them a lot of money. Uh, I assure you it pretty much doesn't. Um, and then we've had a number of security improvements, uh, improvements by, you know, CVE. Uh, bad lock was the famous one, which didn't end up being quite as bad as the hype was, although it was really a pain in the butt for us. Um, but as a result of that, uh, we've changed a lot of default options, and there's been a big push to just make sure that all, from the Microsoft side even, to make sure that old stuff is gone. So Microsoft has started to phase out the SMB1 protocol, um, NTLM v1, uh, which is effectively plain, plain text password equivalent. Um, and so now we ship that as it's turned off, you have to turn it on. Um, and little by little, those little devices, mostly home NAS boxes, um, we start getting complaints that they don't work anymore because they'll only take NTLM v1 or they'll only take SMB1. Um, but those complaints are starting to go away. And then, um, actually, it's Red Hat that did most of this work but to uh, get the Kerberos um, abstraction into Samba so that it could we could ship the AD domain controller. And in Leap 15, we actually have the AD domain controller that's there. We didn't put it in SLES 15. Um, because we didn't feel it was ready for prime time there, but the community can use it. I know it, it gets used quite a bit, and they found quite a few bugs, so it's still a work in progress, but it's, it's going. Okay, so what are we working on now? Um, this one is one that we're actually not working on in SUSE, but it's a, it's a pretty big deal. So multi-channel allows one, session, one SMB session, one file serving session, to span multiple NICs, it will allow you to take advantage of things like, uh, well, multiple NICs. Or if you have um, a, lots of most modern uh, high-speed Ethernet will have um, receive side scaling. So one of the problems, if you only have, if you don't use the receive side scaling, and you only have one connection, you can't use receive side scaling, is you end up being CPU bound. You have one CPU that's working really hard on that one stream, and there are other CPUs sitting there waiting and can't take advantage of the other CPUs because the connection's only going through the, through the one. So the, uh, traditionally, you would just have a lot of clients, but if you had one client that's just trying to do a huge, huge amount of throughput, you wouldn't be able to do this without, without the multi-channel to receive side scaling. So on the server side, this works. Uh, mostly we have one corner case, which pretty much is if you have two clients that are trying to access the same file and, and op blocks are there's an op lock there. When the when the when the break for the op lock comes, if the connection goes down, you can have some data loss. So, so don't actually use it yet unless you're just playing around with it, or you're the only one. You know that you're going to be the only one using it. But it but it is there. The SIF side KO work has not started yet, um, but that's something that should be happening soon. So the uh, Result from both going to the SMB2 protocol, which simplified things, um, and just a lot of other cleanup adding of uh, asynchronous I.O. is that, now this, keep in mind, this is sort of informal testing, but um, this is, was, has been done on several different distributions. Just do a default options mount, one file server, one, one client, CIFSTI KO to a SAMA server, and 
it's faster in most cases than NFS is. So there's, there's traditionally this has not been true, but now it's really it isn't anymore. Um, Sama can really outdo NFS at this point, uh, and that is without some of the newer things that'll be coming in soon. Um, SME Direct is Samba over RDMA. And the SIFS.KO now has it, it's in the Azure kernel, um, it's in the upstream kernel, but it's in the Azure SLES kernel now. It's not completely implemented, but it fundamentally works. And at this point, we can almost saturate a 40 gigabit uh, card. It's pretty impressive. Um, the, the thing that's missing right now is this combination with multi-channel. Now, multi-channel, if I go back to that one, the, one of the requirements on the uh, client side, or one of the decisions that's made on the client side, is that the, only the highest quality available adapter connection will be used. So if you have a 10 gig connection and a 1 gig connection, or a, if you have a 1 gig connection and 30 100 megabit connections, it's going to pick the one gig connection. Um, and maybe you want it for, for redundancy that if you lose your, your uh, Ethernet connection, you unplug your Ethernet connection, the actual connection could stay alive and, and fail over to, the, to, the, to your Wi-Fi. But uh, the connection has to be already be open, and it isn't already open because it'll only do the fastest one. So that's something that it's a potential that's there but doesn't uh, exist yet with SMU Direct is the only case where we'd see improvement with having multiple quality connections. And that is that if you're going to do the, all the setup for RDMA and you're doing all these little operations, particularly metadata operations, it's a giant overhead. And so this is the one case where multi-channel will allow you to do, or will choose to do two different quality connections. It'll send a bunch of the small metadata stuff over the traditional connection, and then all the data will just go over SME Direct. So that's the only piece that's missing from the, from the kernel client side. The Samba side has quite a bit of work left to do um, based on the architecture of Samba, it, just getting the file descriptors passed around between different processes is an issue because, the drive, because of the drivers uh, for RDMA will pretty much you can't just easily pat, switch user IDs, and Samba kind of requires that. So that is a work in progress, but there, there is a bit of time left till that's really done. Um, the protocol itself, SME2, added this idea of credits. So this allows not better performance for one client, but when you have a whole ton of clients and one person's being greedy, credits is uh, the mechanism that they implemented. Basically, every you, you, you get a connection, you ask for some credits, I say, yeah, here you go, here's your 10 cents, you get 10 cents and you get 10 cents. If you spend all your 10 cents in one shot, you're gonna have to wait a little bit before, we, before you can go again. Now, you can edit this from an administrator perspective per client, so you can give some clients preference over others. Um, so this really does help in some larger networks. Now, compounding, which has been in the protocol since the very beginning, was not initially in SMB2. Compounding is what it sounds like, multiple operations in, in one network packet. And especially if you've ever looked at a Windows network trace, it's, they're really chatty. There's a lot of file open, look at one little thing, particularly, we might consider it metadata, but it's stored somewhere in the file. So you have to open the file, look at this attribute, close it. Or if you're updating something, timestamps, uh, flags for a whole directory, you have to do open, change, close, open, change, close, over and over again. And this gets pretty, pretty chatty. And uh, so with the, with the addition of that, and it's now in the SIFS kernel client, um, it's been in the, in the Samba server forever, but it's now in the SIFS kernel client as well. So that really mitigates that problem. It's much, much more streamlined. So now we get to some of the cooler stuff that's going on. And um, so transparent failover, uh, that can mean so many things. In the, in the Windows case, the, the application, the client, the, the client itself has to know the way Microsoft's done this. Um, the application doesn't know that the connection's gone. So when we did CTDB 10 years ago, 
Uh, the ability wasn't there on the client side to do this, so we tried to get things to switch as quickly as possible. And what you would see on the Windows side is, oh, look, there's a hiccup, but everything would keep going. The client would reconnect. Um, sometimes you try to save your file, it wouldn't work, but do it again and it would work. So in, in this case, Transparent failover adds this witness protocol, which Samuel Cabrero and our team is, is working on. And clients can register with the servers. The server does not, as you see, does not have to be on the same uh, box. The witness server doesn't have to be on the same box as the SMB server. And the advantage of this is, well, number one, that gives you the situation where maybe this guy goes away and... His, he, he notices, well, my witness connection's gone. I better try again somewhere else. If the SME connection goes away, well, he has an active connection to the witness server. But more often it's used from the administrator side to switch the client over somewhere else. You know that you're going to be taking, and this is particularly developed for Azure, you know you're going to be taking the system down. You don't want the client to know. You want to move the client over in advance. So the client registers for notifications from the witness server, and the witness server then tells the client, I'm about to move this over somewhere else, you should go somewhere else, tells them where to go. And uh, that really streamlines that whole process. So Samuel actually just got this working, functioning yesterday, and showed me yesterday. Um, it was really cool. So it does require a common storage backend. So on the Windows side, there are pretty heavy restrictions on what devices are supported. Um, what Sunwell's done this with is with Ceph. And with the help of Dave Disseldorp, who's doing the Ceph integration on, on Samba. So he's got this sitting on top of there, and he just tells, tells the witness server that things are moving over. The client just connects seamlessly without anybody knowing from the, from the like, the co he's got a copy going, and it just keeps going. So this part's... I actually got a ton of work to do, but it's a lot of really cool stuff. So, so Dave Disseldorp picked up where the Ink Tank team left off. They in, implemented uh, a this Ceph, uh, this Samba has its own VFS layer, and they implemented a VFS in Samba basically so that it could work. One Samba server could just sit on top of one one uh, Ceph endpoint. I can't remember what you call them. In Ceph, but he uh, it basically the function worked. It could do POSIX exacles, and it was good enough for the for the starting case. So what we wanted to do was add clustering to this. In order to do this, um, well, one of the one of the first sol solutions that was thought of was use the Rados block device and share that block device over a bunch of install another file system like OCFS2 or whatever on that block device. Um, the performance of, of that would just be awful with Ceph, and you'd really be trying to shove something in that just, just wouldn't fit. So he uses uh, libcephfs instead, and then CTDB used to require that you would have a file lock for the case of recovering, um, cause, because CTDB was originally designed around simply a clustered file system, not a whole cluster. So. With this Rados Mutex helper, it eliminates the need for having this common file system lock that, that helps in that recovery case. So things that we're uh, considering for the future, and this, this is not an accidental choice of words with the richer ACL support. Um, someday, maybe, rich ACLs will happen. Um, but in, in any case, uh, we, be able to need, we, we need to be able to use other protocols. We need to have better ACLs than just the POSIX ACLs for Windows clients. So whether it's rich ACLs, NFS4 ACLs, which are pretty close, um, that's one of the things that we're working on. Now, the cross-protocol client caching um, is, is leasing would be a really great thing because we can do it with Samba if you only have Samba clients. But now if you want to have an NFS client or a local client do it, and someone's got a, uh, their, the files cached over on the client side, there's no with Ceph right now. There's no mechanism, no way for the client, the another protocol to know. Well, I lost my lease. That op lock's been broken, so that really needs to be done. Um, an AD integration uh, is. I don't know enough about Ceph and how the user mapping works, but you can't just arbitrarily 
assign something. So I know that there's uh, AD, AD integration work going on so that you can use an Active Directory Winbind kind of a, of a solution to be able to do that. And then these other features that I showed you, uh, that it, they don't just easily port over because somehow you have to fit them into the, into the Ceph model, and that's something that David's considering and we'll be working with him on in the future. That's, we don't really have a lot of details on that yet, but that's something that we need to, need to be keeping our eye on. So what's going to be coming soon? Sorry, I'm really trying to squeeze this in in shorter time. So um, persistent handles. Now, traditionally on a Windows client, you're working along, I described this before, you go to save the file, <sighs> server's down. But it come, the client itself reconnects. With um, so SMB2, they introduce something called durable handles, which provide uh, not guarantees, but there's a decent chance if, if you have a network hiccup, you'll still have your file open. You'll still have all your locks, your op locks, the share modes that Windows uses, so you can survive these, smart, these short network outages. What persistent handles includes is the ability to do things like you're going to reopen on a different server. Like you got disconnected and you reconnect on a different server or on the same server with a reboot, your files will still be open. So a lot of that work is done. And in fact, it was required for the work, the, the demonstration that Sam, someone was, was giving me. Um, that's not in the uh, upstream code yet, but it's getting close. So it should be there pretty soon. Directory releases will just allow us to cache the directory metadata on one server, on a, on a client and not have to query it every time and have it be reliable. So someone else comes in and changes the directory, the first client will get notified, oh, your, your cache is no longer good and, and it'll break the lease. So that's something that we don't have on the server side or on the client side, but it, it, it is being explored right now. Something we've been working on for years, uh, many years ago we did on the uh, original SMBFS and then on SIFS, was Unix extensions just to allow things like mode bits to be Set across, sent across, but the POSIX extensions are now are we're working on a standard that Microsoft will agree on, and that then just a lot more information, sim links, things like that can go across without funky. We do tricks right now to send sim links across, and this will allow us to do things like that. So DFS failover, um, this sort of the primitive uh, failover kind of mechanism, and. When you talk to a Windows DFS server, you open up your, you try to open up your server and it says, no, no, I'm not really the server. This guy's really the server. But that gives you one central point. So this goes way back to Windows NT. And the way it's worked so far with, with this client, if you lost your connection to the first server, if there was a second alternate server, you just, it was lost. You didn't know. You just had to start over, uh, force unmount the file system, remount it. And so um, Aurelian is on, on our team as well. Got that, or is in the process of finishing that up for this. This is the easy case of a failover. Mostly unrelated, even though it both says DFS that someone's working on, is the DFS replication. And it, it has the same name because that's the new one of the ways that they replicate the files for the DFS services. But it is used by the AD domain controller to replicate to other domain controllers or to replicate group policy data down to the client, and so Sunwell's been working on that and has uh, quite a bit of stuff working there as well, which leads me to the group policy objects, which I know product management folks will know. I don't know if anybody else is familiar with it. Allows you to define a set of policies, settings for all sorts of applications in the system from the directory itself. Um, so David Mulder, we got from from what used to be Ventella and did this sort of thing there. And he's been working on both getting the, the client policies pushed down and the extension so that, say, you could set common settings for passwords for Firefox. You could actually set, set this out to other applications. And he'll, so he'll provide a bunch of samples and hopefully we'll have uh, some adoption with with other applications that uh, we're, we'll be happy to help you with. And then he actually has, he demonstrated this uh, last year, but he's got some updates to it that you can actually edit those group policies within YAST. Um, cross forest trust on the domain, Samba domain controller. So since we haven't had the Samba domain controller before, it wasn't a big deal, but it will be a big deal once we are, once we have it out there. Um, so that it's just a, uh, 
Better way to have larger networks, pretty much. I don't want to get into it at this point. One-way trust is a big deal. We have a lot of cases where you have separate sites and you only want to be able to have the domain controller be able to see to another site. Um, that hasn't worked for us ever in Samba and um, has been requested for a long time and that should be out pretty soon as well. So I, this was a lot of stuff in a lot of areas in a very short period of time. So we are out of time, but I will be happy to answer any questions outside afterwards. Thank you.